All right, straight from business to warfare. So we started a series a couple of, uh, couple of weeks ago called War in the Wilderness, uh, Fight for Your Family When Life Isn't As It Should Be. And my, my um, hope for this series has been to be one, transparent, and to show you that everybody goes through difficulty in life. And we, we talked about the metaphor in the Bible for life is actually wilderness. I don't, I don't know if you ever thought about that before this series, but between Genesis chapter 2 and the Garden of Eden and all of that and Revelation 22, there is only wilderness in the scripture. And there are basically three kinds, Midbar, Siah, and Yashimon. Midbar is desert you can survive in if you know what you're doing. You've been in those parts of life. They're called normal. Then you have Sia, desert you could survive in if you have help, and you've been there probably too. You could think back over times in your life where you think, I wouldn't have survived that if it hadn't been for this person or these people. Uh, wilderness you can survive in if you have help. And then there's Yashimon, and that's, that's desert you, you can't survive in. And uh, you need a miracle from God in, in that time. You need the presence of God in that time. And you might have been through something like that, too, where you look back and, and you would say, if, if it hadn't been for the way God moved this way or that way or the other way, I would not have survived that. But this is life. The hope is uh, restoration of all things is coming. Uh, a day, Revelation 22, where Jesus will return and make all things new. There will be no more tear, no, no more crying, no more pain anymore. Sin will be outside the camp. There will be no more death all of that will be judged. Uh, that's in our future. But until then, we, we walk in uh, the wilderness. And today, what I want to do is talk about the warfare in the context of that wilderness and just kind of awaken you to it. So if you would stand with me as we read God's word, we'll read verses 10 to 12 of Ephesians chapter 6. And if you're our guest, we say this phrase, the very words at the end of the main text reading just to distinguish God's word from my own. So here's what the scripture says. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You can be seated. Now... My goal here uh, is not to breed uh, fear or to give the enemy, Satan, any fame. And in fact, it's the opposite. My goal is uh, to give you hope and to defame the name of the enemy. But what I want to do biblically is pull back the curtain on, on spiritual warfare and let you see how he works. And you'll recognize it from your own life, uh, probably, uh, as we begin to look at, at these things. I think before we talk about that, I need to mention uh, what is utterly true, that there was a day outside the city walls of Jerusalem in the first century when the enemy that we're going to talk about today, he thought he had his great military, greatest militaristic victory he, he's ever had, and that was the day that Jesus was crucified and they pulled him off a cross, and they la laid him in, in the tomb, and he was dead. And the enemy thought he, 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 had, he had prevailed. And on the third day, according to the scriptures and the 500 eyewitnesses, Jesus arose and defeated the penalty of sin and death. And death is the, the, the thing that, that the enemy has that, that, that's the worst thing he can throw at us. Um, kind of, he also uh, has the penalty of, of sin. If he can draw us into sin and make us rec real, walk in it, then we face the consequences and all the brutality of that. And anyway, Jesus de defeated the penalty of sin and death when he rose again and he ascended to the Father. He's coming back again. So the enemy that we're going to talk about today, he's already been defamed. The writer of Colossians, Paul said, he's the one that's been put to open shame. All you have to do is remind him of Jesus, because Jesus is victorious. He sits at the right hand of the Father. He's coming back again, 
right? So we need to frame it like that. And I want to read this one scripture Paul wrote to the church at Rome. In Romans chapter 16, verse 20, they were facing all kinds of spiritual warfare. And Paul kind of signs off like this. And I want to start like he signs off and finish like he signs off. In Romans 16, verse 20, it says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Hold on to that today because his demise, utter demise, is coming. And his grace is sufficient for the war in the wilderness. Now, let me define spiritual warfare for you uh, because we probably come to that term with lots of different thoughts. But spiritual warfare is any scheme, strategy, or hostility designed and implemented to obliterate shalom or peace and broker destructive chaos in a life, in families, in generations, and among the nations with the intent of eternal demise and chaos, right? It's a big, long definition to say what Jesus said about the enemy is true. His mission is to steal, kill, and destroy, and he will try to do it with people, families, Churches, in fact, people, groups, generations, he's at work, right? And we need to understand that today. And I'm going to make four observations this morning about warfare that should help us get our mind around this. Next week, we're going to talk about how to fight on Mother's Day. (laughs) Lands perfectly. But it kind of does. It kind of does. So, uh, but today, I just want to awaken you to these things. So, uh, observation number one, we are experiencing warfare on three fronts, spiritual warfare on, th- on three, f- three fronts, and, and, and these will make sense to you. The, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, that, that we are experiencing warfare that is worldly. It is cultural, all right? So, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So we as Christians have our citizenship in heaven, and our king is otherworldly. So the kings of this world and the cultures of this world, no matter where you grow up or where you're from, you're always, as a Christian, going uh, in a direction that is opposite of the culture. That's why Paul said, hey, as a Christian, you're going to have to... um, Be someone who's in the world, but not of the world. You can't love it so much, right? And we struggle with that. How many of you know we struggle with that? I mean, it's kind of obvious. We as Christians, we struggle with this thing of loving the, the world so much. The culture impacts us. It's philosophies, it's schemes, it's it's trends, you know, all of those kinds of things. So one front is just the world, just the culture we live in. But the second front is our own flesh. Right? So how many of you know you struggle with your flesh? Just raise your hand. Be loud and be proud. It's very true that every one of us, we struggle with our own flesh, our humanity, the temptations of the flesh, our appetites. Romans chapter 7, verse 18, Paul said the same thing. Uh, he, Paul was like a zealot for God. He was one of the most disciplined intellectual people who, were, who was living for God that you would ever come across in your lifetime. And yet he says in Romans 7, verse 18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me. That is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Has anybody felt like that? Like, I don't want to do wrong things, but I, this is the flesh. And we, we, we wage war against the flesh. We're fighting our, ourselves, so to speak. So the world and the flesh are two of the fronts, but the third front is just what I'm going to put under the category of the devil. So Ephesians 6.12, again, we read it, but I'll read it again. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So we are up against a warfare that is led by a general of sorts on the evil side of things. Um, we call him the devil, Lucifer, Satan, the adversary, the enemy, all, all words used in the context of scripture, liar, father of lies, prince of the power of the air, all in the context of scripture. He is a, uh, uh, a fallen angel that wanted to be like God. He, want, he was so prideful. And do you guys know all, the root of every sin is pride? 
Did you know that? Any sin, you list it, it starts with pride. This is the chief sin of this particular angel who's thrown from heaven. We see that in Isaiah. And uh, he had others that followed him, and they were thrown from heaven, and they walk, uh, they work in the world among the generations. And as Jesus has an ever-expanding kingdom, the enemy is tr- trying to thwart that. That is the epic battle, and he works in a militaristic way, meaning he does things to come against us. Now, so, have you ever been around someone who sees a demon under every rock? Like, there's a demon, I'm under attack. So let me just say a couple things. Like, first of all, there's not a demon under every rock. Uh, But maybe every third rock. (laughs) Not the world, not the flesh, but the devil, right? Um, You can make consequentially horrible decisions and find yourself in a very, very sufferous place. And sometimes people do that and cry spiritual attack. And that's bunk. That's called making a decision that's terrible. It's usually a sinful decision, and it ends you in a bad place, right? It's still the wilderness, still hard. Thank God for repentance, right? But, but that's, that's not necessarily a, a, a spiritual attack, right? Um, but maybe every, every, every third rock. Now, the good news, and this is my observation number two, is that Jesus has authority, all authority on heaven and on earth said it very clearly in Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus came and said to them, the disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. We see you in, if you study who Jesus is in scripture, he is primary, preeminent, first, king, Lord, always, beginning and end. I mean, he has ultimate authority over everything. Every angel, every demon, every person, everything he has authority over. One great illustration of that takes place in Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. We don't have time to read the whole thing today. I will read you one verse, but I will summarize it for you. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus got off of a boat in a place uh, uh, just across from his ministry headquarters in Capernaum. He sailed across to what is known as the Decapolis, the place of 10 cities. And uh, it's pagan there. And he, he, he got off the boat. When I say pagan, I mean they worship multiple gods. They do whatever they want, the flesh. They don't care about the Yahweh God uh, that the Jews care about in that, that time frame. They just, they just live for themselves and do whatever they want. Jesus gets off the boat. I've gotten off a boat a million times right where he got off a boat. You hike up there, and you get up there, and the archaeology is opulent. There are paved streets and marble columns, green from Italy, red from Egypt, white from just right right around there in Israel, Syria, Jordan, that kind of thing. Beautiful. The buildings, the structures are amazing. There there are multiple uh, temples, multiple fountains. There are many gods Uh, worshipped up there, and they have the best view of the whole Sea of Galilee of of anybody, right? Um, They eat bacon up there because we find out in this text they have pigs. They wouldn't have that on the most religious side of the lake. We're we're in Capernaum where Jesus' headquarters were. So he goes to the other side, it says. When he gets there, he's met with a man who is full of demons. And this man is described as as a man in the text who... Uh, he cries out in the night. He cuts himself. He uh, runs through the, the areas of the tomb, just telling us like he's unclean, he's possessed, he's self-mutilating. Can you imagine being a parent in that town? Like, hey, kids, just make sure you stay away from the man. Um, really, right? That stuff, <clears throat> that stuff is real. That stuff is real. And so... So Jesus walks in, and it says that the man that was full of demons that was cutting himself and screaming and w- running around with no clothes on, he comes up to Jesus, and it says Jesus was already casting the demons out in the text. If you read the text, he's already, I don't know if it's like some spiritual thing or if he's saying that thing. I don't know how it is, but the man, the man shows up, and in Mark chapter 5, Verse 7, it says, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not 
torment me. These demons have really good theology. That man may be crazy, but these demons know who they're dealing with. Jesus just walks into town, and they're begging him not to torment him. This is Jesus, what he does, he asks the, the demon his name. He says, "Is legion, for we are many, right? That's scary. That's right in the middle of like, ah, of some like horror movie. Not for Jesus. Not for Jesus. He sends them into a herd of pigs. And they go over the side of the cliff and into the sea. And this baffles everybody. And this man that was running through the tombs and screaming and cutting himself and no clothes, he sat there. The text says he sits there clothed in his right mind. That's the result. He sits there clothed in his right mind. And the people are horrified. They're not horrified of the demon guy. That was normal. Now this man that was full of demons sits there clothed in his right mind and everybody's afraid. They're like, get out of here. Except that guy that's clothed in his right mind, he's like, can I go with you? You just changed everything for me. You're the one that has authority over what I could not have authority over. You know what Jesus does? He goes, this is one of the only times in Scripture you see this, but he's like, no, man, you stay right here. You tell everybody. I mean, every other time so you're looking at, you're like, don't tell anybody yet. It's not my time. Don't tell anybody yet. It's not my time. Here he's like, you tell everybody what just happened because everybody knows you. You're the crazy man running through the tombs. You're going to have a platform. That's the first missionary to the Gentiles in the Bible. Probably you could trace your heritage back to that dude. He leaves them there 200 years later. I'm not kidding. 200 years later, 300 years later, that whole side of the lake is completely Christian. And the bishop of Susida, which is the town where this was, writes something called the Nicene Creed that underlies all of our theology. Go Google it and read it one day. It screams, Jesus is the Son of God, right? That he has authority over everything, right? Which, which is why I would say, I've said all along the way, and I, I would say to you now, even, even as uh, we, my family, we walked through like really, really hard things, brutal things, and if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you've got to go back and watch message number one in this series, because I don't have the emotional fortitude to recap that every week, but it was tough. It was hard. It was difficult. And here's what I know. It can be brutal, and you, you, will, you, will, you will have emotional wounds. You will have physical wounds. You will have spiritual wounds, but Jesus is over all of it. The enemy has no hold, and, and as I felt sad. I felt hurt. I felt depressed. I never felt scared. Why? Because I kept remembering Mark chapter 5. The enemy's coming against me, but Jesus has all authority. That's my second observation. Here's the third observation. The, the enemy works in, in common ways. He, he has very common tactics. He does the same thing over and over again. And when you begin to recognize those things, you understand when you're in warfare and when you're not, right? Right? So let's just talk about a, a couple of items here. First of all, oppression and possession are real issues. Oppression and possession, demonic oppression and possession are real issues. Since the Enlightenment, the church in the West has pushed away from that and said, these aren't real things. That happens over there or it happened back then. It doesn't happen up in here because we are enlightened. But the reality is... It does. It's in the scripture. It says we will. And I can tell you, after 25 years of, of pastoring, anecdotally, I have seen, seen some things that could not be explained any other way except demonic oppression and possession. Bar none. I, I, I understand mental health. I understand uh, um, physical health issues. Not everybody that has a mental health issue is facing a spiritual warfare issue. Not everybody that has a physical health issue is facing a spiritual warfare issue. But there are times when someone is full of the demonic, 
right? There are times when someone is oppressed. Um, you are all possessed, okay? This is the biblical view. You are all possessed, either by the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of light. You're born, because of your fathers, you're born into sin, right? And so because we're born into sin, we're, we're in, uh, as soon as we're thinking, we're at war with God. You know, we, we, we're born liars, born thieves. Like, how do my kids know how to cuss that soon, right? We're, we catch that stuff. We know how to do it, right? It's, we're, we're just born into that. And because of that, we're at war with God, and, and everyone is possessed either by the kingdom of darkness or transferred by his son Jesus to a new kingdom, the kingdom of light. And this is the work Jesus did on a cross. It's that redemption that I'm going to buy them from that kingdom of darkness. I'm going to transfer them to the kingdom of light. That's why it says you've been bought with a price, right? That's the price of his blood shed on the cross. So everyone is possessed. A follower of Jesus cannot be possessed by a demon if they are a true follower of Jesus. The caveat is that in Matthew chapter 7, we hear Jesus saying to some people who were saying, Lord, didn't we clothe them in your name and cast out demons in your name and do all this stuff in your name? And Jesus says, "Uh, away from me, I never knew you. So apparently there are people who think they are followers of Jesus who aren't. And that's one of the tricky parts, right? So how do you know if you're a follower of Jesus? Not because you did something in his name, but because you confessed him in utter humility that he is Lord, that you came and you said, in my sin, I cannot rescue myself. I'm going to rely completely on you to transfer me from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And I'm going to follow you because I love you so much. I'm like the guy in Mark chapter 5, like, let me go with you. And so that confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart. That's a, a Greek word, pistua, that means believe in, your, in such a way that it becomes actionable. And so you can tell someone's a Christian if they're, you just look at their fruit. They don't have to be perfect. I'm not looking for perfection. I'm not, I'm not perfect. But just look at the trajectory of their life, their fruit, how they walk. You can smell it. You can see it. Also, you can see someone who says, but Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? And wasn't I this? And wasn't I that? And, and then there's no fruit. The trajectory of their life would say they're not a follower of Jesus. I mean, they might, they might have a role. They might have, you know, they might say they go to church, whatever. The, the point is this. Not everything is what it seems with people, even in the context of, of, of the church. And so you need to make sure that you understand that people who follow Jesus cannot be possessed, but some people say they follow Jesus and don't follow Jesus, and in that case, they could be, right? Also, followers of Jesus can be oppressed, right? So one of the ways, one of the key tactics that the enemy uses is that he makes assignments. He makes assignments. It's very militaristic. So if he's trying to expand his kingdom or take as many people down with him as possible, you, 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 you decide. He is going to work in a strategic way according to his understanding of human behavior, and he's going to use every kind of trick in the book, and he's going to make assignments to people, to families, to people groups, and to nations. Now, we see that, we see those assignments, uh, in, uh, examples of them in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, and 1 Kings, you can go Look at those, but he makes assignments, and I I am of the firm believer that he makes assignments um, based on threats. So what do I mean by that? Like, um, people that are walking close to Jesus get special assignments because they're threatening to the kingdom of darkness. Not because they're anything, but because of how close they are to Jesus, right? So you might say to yourself, well, the easiest way to avoid spiritual warfare is to stay far from Jesus. <laughs> stay far away. And I would say you're absolutely 100% right. If you stay far away from him, you will, ha- you will live your best life uh, now. The problem is later. And that's when you will face uh, utter consequences. 
you know. And so with the close proximity to Jesus, Jesus would say things like, they hate, they hate you because they hate me. They, they, they're going to try to kill you because they're going to try to kill me. Take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me because it's going to be like taking up a cross. Follow me. You know, he, it's, it's assignments are made. Now, remember I said Jesus has all authority. So if he has all authority... Even in any assignment the enemy makes, who can break that assignment? Who can release that demon from their assignment if he so chooses? Jesus. He has all authority. You're saying to yourself, well, why doesn't he just do it then? Why doesn't he just release all of us from this demonic oppression that we face? And I would just push you back to that first sermon. If you haven't watched it, go watch it because it it answers the question, why? But he has authority. He also, the enemy, the way that he works is he tries to breach open doors. So we we have areas of our life where we kind of open the door. Um, Did you ever, when you were a kid, like try to get in a church or a school that was locked, but you knew like somewhere around this building, someone probably propped a door? Anybody ever do that? Like, I just want to go shoot baskets. Maybe it was just me. But a prop door, what does it do? It breaches security. Even if it's only propped like this much, it breaches security. And that's what the enemy does. Ephesians chapter 4, 26 to 27, uh, Paul was writing to the church of Ephesus, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now that, that phrase, give no opportunity, it, it could also be translated, give no foothold. Like don't let him have any place to, to get a leg up on you. It could also be translated, don't give him an open door in your life, right? Because he likes to breach open doors. And uh, a lot of times open doors, people are like, what is an open door? A lot of times open doors are hidden things in the context of family or hidden things in the context of your own life. I'm going to use one example because it's so prevalent, the issue of pornography. So if you have a pornography addiction, it's hidden. Pornea is actually a, a, a biblical term, and it's, it, it, it is the fruit of Satan. If you look at the difference between the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of Satan, you'll find pornea listed. It's all this, this sexual sin. And so if you have that hidden, you think, okay, it's, it, it's not hurting anybody else but me. Nobody knows. It's not going to hurt. What the enemy does is he, like, lets you think it's okay for a long time. Then he breaches that, and then it explodes on everybody. And you've got chaos. You've got cataclysm. No more shalom. You've got brokenness. He, he just, like, loves to use that one. And statistics would say in a room this size, although every, no one would want to admit it, there are a lot of people that have a hidden problem with that. And so this is one way that he breaches, right, if we have hidden things. It could be a lot of different hidden things, but don't let the sun go down on your anger. This was an anger issue that, that, that Paul was writing about in Ephesians. That's an opportunity for the devil. I mean, it could be lots of different things, but he breaches open doors. And we'll talk about how to shut those doors next week. He lies. This is his tactic. He tells lies about God himself and others. He is a liar. If you're ever in a situation like everything is full of lies and confusion, like you know the truth, but everything around you, everybody's like, this is believing lies and confusion. That is the fingerprints of the enemy, okay? This is how he works. And we can believe lies. We're not, uh, we can truly believe things about God, ourselves, and others that aren't true. He wants us to. Fear is, is, is a tactic of his. He prowls around like a roaring lion, which means he's going he's gonna to be loud and proud sometimes, um, but he's a defeated foe, and he uses isolation. So he wants to pick you off in isolation. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, early on, Adam in, in, in this paradise that God's created, and it says, it wasn't, God said it wasn't good for man to be alone. It wasn't good for man to be alone. So he created a helper suitable for him. Now, that's, I mean, that's before sin entered the picture. It wasn't good for him to, uh, to be alone. And so he created this helper. When I think of the word helper, a lot of times I just remember like laying under the car, handing my dad tools while he was fixing stuff, right? Like 
That's a helper. That's not this word. This word, azar, is a Hebrew term that means like if, if my wife was standing right behind me and she was looking that way and we locked elbows so that any way we turned, uh, we, we could see everything. It is a helper in battle, not a helper in handing tools, right? So the church has gotten this wrong a lot, and we, we, we don't see the need sometimes. And it is imperative that we do not go it alone. When you think, well, I don't have a helper, I'm not married or whatever, look around you. You should have community in the context of the body of Christ. You need somebody. I can't tell you how many times as a pastor I've talked to, to, to people, like, they'll come to my office and say, this guy is going through this particular thing, and it is egregious, it is bad, it is hidden, we need to confront him and help him, like, get out of that and restore him to the body, and I'll say, okay, who is his best friend? Who is the person that, that he's going to listen to? Because sometimes it's no bueno just for Pastor Brian to show up, right? Hey, I'm here, got my pocket puff, and I got to tell you, uh, you can't do that anymore. No, we need a friend. We need somebody that he's got relationship with. And a lot of times people will say, uh, he doesn't have a best friend. He doesn't know anybody like that. There's nobody like that in his life. We all need people like that in our lives. It's not good to be alone. The enemy picks you off when you isolate. Just in context of marriage, you start to see your spouse isolating a lot. Um, hey, you better get on that. You know, what is going on there? You know, isolation is no good. All right, so that's my third observation. Here's the fourth. There are, he doesn't only use common tactics, but there are clear impacts of spiritual warfare. Um, it is all connected, mind, body, and soul. Right? So we like in our Greek way of thinking to say the physical health part is over here and the mental health part is over here and the spiritual health part is over here and they don't really impact each other. But the way you're created is more like a spider's web that's all intertwined. So if you pull like one little string of that spider's web, the whole thing moves because it's all, you're uniquely designed. You are spiritual, emotional, and physical. You are, you, all of that is connected, and we have to understand that to understand the impacts of warfare. In 1 Kings, we get a really great example of how this uh, works. 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19 speaks of the story of Elijah and 400 prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. And uh, Elijah was living in a season where he thought he was the only prophet of God left in Israel. And the Canaanite Baalism had come to Israel through the prophetess Jezebel, Jezebel in an unholy marriage with the king. And she was powerful, ruthless, in fact. And she was trying to rid the world of Elijah. And he was on the run. He had to be exhausted before we get to this battle that, that we see him take part of. But he does. He, he, he draws the line in the sand eventually, and there's a showdown on Mount, Mount Carmel. Uh, 400 prophets of Baal gather. They build an altar, and Elijah basically says, we're going to call fire from heaven. If you call Baal and he rains down fire from heaven, then uh, we'll know he is God. But if he doesn't, and I call Yahweh, and he rains down fire from heaven, we will know he is God. And he does it so the whole world will know there's a God. And so 400 prophets of Baal plus all the gatherers, they come together. They're beating drums. They're cutting themselves. They're crying out to, to Baal, and nothing's happening for hours. Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. So much so that Elijah gets snarky. In the text, it says he's saying stuff like, maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's in the bathroom. It's in the text. It is there. Nothing happens. And so, so Elijah then, then, then calls on God. And fire falls. And it says that the bodies of these prophets of Baal were strown for miles. That, that, that God won this ultimate victory. Elijah was a part of it. He takes off on the run after that because Jezebel puts a hit out on him. She wants him not just dead, but like double dead dead. You know, she wants his head on a stick. And so <clears throat> it says in 1 Kings chapter 19, 4 to 8, but he himself went a day's journey, guess where? 
into the wilderness, right? Here he finds himself. You'd think he'd go to Disneyland after a victory like that. You'd think that's where all the Super Bowl guys go, but not him. Into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. That's a tree about this tall with barely any shade that you have to like crawl up under to, to get any. It'd be enough for one person. And he asked that he might die. Like, kill me now. He's exhausted. He's depressed. Even though it was a great victory, he, he, there's a bounty out on him. He would rather just die in the wilderness. And he asked that he might die, saying, it, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under this broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. Wish I had time to unpack all that, but it's profound. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and he ate and he drank and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights. To Horeb, the mountain of God, we think is in Mount Sinai. So what are the impacts of war on Elijah? He's exhausted. He's depressed. He's suicidal. He's alone. He needs relief. He's not getting it. So he says, God, like, take me home now. A few of you in this room might have been there in your life. This is the impacts of war, and the impacts are multifaceted. They can show up like confusion, calamity, chaos, lies everywhere. There are mental and emotional impacts. Uh, when you're impacted by spiritual warfare, it can result in depression. It can result in anxiety. Not all depression is spiritual warfare. Not all anxiety is spiritual warfare, but spiritual warfare can result in depression, can result in anxiety. It can have physical impacts. Do you know that we deal with people all the time that are cutting, just like the man in Mark chapter 5, self-mutilation, right? This often looks like the impact of spiritual uh, warfare. Why would that be an impact of spiritual warfare, an obvious one? Because if we're created in the image of God and we self-mutilate, it's like we're mutilating the image of God. You know, this is, this is what it is. There are uh, physical impacts like addiction, eating disorders, body dysphoria, identity confusion, all these things. Prolonged seasons of warfare can yield all, all of that. And the spiritual impacts look like unbelief, like God is not good because I've gone through so much. I mean, if you're Elijah, you get through all that and you find yourself in the wilderness under a broom tree with nothing to eat or drink, who are you, God? Like... Unbelief, generational sin or trauma. Have you ever seen in a family, may you recognize it in your own, the same sins passed down from one generation to the next? That's generational sin because the assignment was made somewhere back in the day and it's been get bearing fruit, generational sin. Also, trauma can be passed that way, generational trauma from one generation to the next. But did you know also hope can be passed that way, victory can be passed that way, through the generations, but the enemy works to thwart all of that. Bondage is a spiritual impact. It often looks like addiction. It's where the enemy puts you in a cage so that you feel like, I, I, I can't do anything or get anywhere. I'm stuck, stuck because of whatever it is, it's drugs, alcohol, pornography, people, you name it, but addiction in the form of bondage. There's this thing called soul ties that nobody thinks about that is so, so real. You know, Paul said, well, let me back one step up and say, when you get married, you marry somebody, uh, you consummate the marriage in sexual intercourse. That's the consummation of the marriage, right? It's got a physical aspect to something spiritual that's being done. Paul said uh, that sexual sin is, is more consequential than all the other sins, and I think that's why, because it is, a, it, it is physical and spiritual, and it was meant for a specific place between two people for a lifetime. The problem is we go crazy with that thing. And so 
the reality becomes we, if we have had sex leading up to marriage with multiple people, even in the, the use of pornography with multiple people virtually, the reality is we have soul ties with multiple people because we've done something physical that is spiritual, that is meant to connect two people for a lifetime. So that's why you come to a marriage, if you've had all those experiences before you come to a marriage, you bring into the marriage, like, uh, we just call it baggage to be nice, but it, it's like, man, it's all this shame, guilt, difficulty, comparison, all these kinds of things, you know, it's, it's real because of soul ties. And those soul ties follow you. <laughs> it's like, we have to break those spiritually in, in prayer. People don't think about those things. Sometimes we just label them like psychologically. People um, are this, that, or the other, like they're addicted to people or codependent or all those things. But sometimes it's, it's something super, super spiritual. And this is why, on the flip side, this is why it is not archaic to say sex is created for one man and one woman for a lifetime. It is so loving to say that. And it is the best way to live. And thank God for repentance and thank God for grace and thank God that Jesus has authority over all of it and he can break every one of those soul ties and give you a fresh start and all of that. But but man, can we please hold on to the biblical design for sex? Because the spiritual impact is real. Right. So I've thrown at you a lot. If this is your first time you've ever come to church, you're like, oh my goodness, that dude is nuts. And uh, I think that's what the enemy would like you to think. I think um, if I'm nuts, we don't need Jesus at all. You know, we do this weird thing where we trust him for our eternity beyond what we can control trust him for heaven. We trust him for our salvation. We trust him uh, for these big words like redemption and justification. And, um, but we don't trust that there's a war going on to thwart these things. We don't trust that there is an enemy that Jesus mentions over and over again. We don't trust that assignments are being made. We don't trust that we need to, tr- to, to, to hold on to his authority. I'll read this. Next week, we are, we are going to talk about how to fight, and I actually think it's really appropriate for Mother's Day because, Mom, you are right in the middle so much, so much. But how do you respond to this message today? Because I really haven't given you anything to do. And that's like, you can't do that as a preacher. you got to tell them like, what to do, but I'm going to leave you hanging till next week. Except to say this, maybe, perhaps, you need to surrender in this war to Jesus. Maybe that needs to be your step today. Maybe you just need to wake up. Paul said it this way. I said it at the beginning. I'll say it at the end. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Until then, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to be with you. Because it's on. There's a war in the wilderness. And you're in it. You're in it. But the good thing is, uh, we're victorious. Utterly victorious in Christ. The bad thing is, I don't see any Black Hawk helicopters. It's like, I will be with you. I will be with you. I will be with you. So you bow your head and close your eyes. And just ask the Lord to speak to you. Lord, we struggle with this. We're not going to lie. We don't want to believe it's true. Yet it explains some things. Jesus, I thank you that you're the one who can walk into a place and the demons recognize you and flee. Father, let us never ever drift far from you because you're the one that has all authority, all power. 
Father, for people here today that maybe they're, they're going through what they recognize in this moment as warfare, spiritual warfare, God, I pray for them in Jesus' name. You would draw them near to you by your spirit. If they're far from you, draw them near. The enemy will hate that. Nearness with you is awesome. Not because there's no pain there, but because you are present there. And God, I pray that you would draw them near to you. And I pray in the name of Jesus for whatever they're struggling with and whatever powers and principalities have come against each person or each family in this place, I pray in the name of Jesus that they would recognize that and they would see that you have authority. And God, would you release those demons from their assignments in Jesus' name? You could say the word, and they have to go into the pigs. God, some of us, we just need to lay under the broom tree and sleep. And God, would you just meet us there with that hospitality, that that bread and water, and just sit with us and give us what we need for the next 40 God, let us trust you. Let us believe you. Let us hope in you. Let us have victory in you. And we pray it all in Jesus' strong name. Amen.